My name is Boris Dyatlov, name changed, and I live in a small town in central Russia. I work as a policeman, almost like a sheriff in America. Everyone in town knows me and we don't usually have any problems with crime, except for petty thefts or drunken fights on Fridays. I joined the police force less than 30 years ago, right around the time the Soviet Union collapsed. I was young and naive, mostly assigned to carry paperwork for senior officers and drive to domestic altercations. But one day a particularly strange incident occurred that I want to tell you about. A few months after I started my service, animals started disappearing in our town. First all the stray dogs and cats disappeared, and then the pets started disappearing after that. Days later we would find the disfigured bodies of animals, with no skin, no eyes, and no insides. People began complaining in mass about this and asking us to take action. Of course, this unimportant business was given to me. In my country, the police don't care about animals, and all such cases are handed over to young officers who still have milk on their lips. This expression is used in Russia to show the inexperience of young people. For three weeks I had been collecting all the missing animal reports and searching. I interviewed cat and dog owners, went to kennels and shelters looking for even a little information, but all was in vain. I found no trace and the case seemed like a dead end. But no one scolded me for that, either. Like I said, nobody cared. But one day people started going missing. The first one to go missing was a little boy, six-year-old Vanya Petrov, name changed. He was walking in the yard with other kids, but he decided to go behind the house and no one else saw him. He was a red-haired little boy with freckles on his face and big green eyes. I knew his father personally, so I went to school with him. Three other children between the ages of five and ten disappeared after Vanya, under similar circumstances. We didn't find any trace of them for weeks, and then we found the first body in a clearing near the city. This place was close to the home of the first missing boy. The body was mutilated just like the bodies of the missing animals. No skin. I knew right away it was the same person doing it. He was skinning professionally, as if he had been doing it for years. At first we thought some doctor had lost his mind, but we checked the alibis of all the doctors and vets in our small town and they all had alibis. We were stumped again. Someone in town is masterfully skinning people and animals and going undetected, which means we're not doing our job well. Time passed, new bodies appeared, but the investigation did not move. One day I was sitting at my desk sorting through papers when suddenly a thought occurred to me that none of the other cops paid any attention to. We find bodies without skin, but we don't find skin. So this maniac needs it for something. What can you make out of leather and fur? They could be boiled and eaten, but if he were a cannibal, he'd take the meat, not the skin. That wasn't an option and I didn't have any other ideas. But I figured out how to proceed. You will call me cruel, but I could not do otherwise. I went to a neighboring village about an hour's drive from my town, and I found a stray dog there. I went back to my town with him and let him out on the street. Afterwards, I started following him. I followed him all day, watching him from afar in civilian clothes and pretending I wasn't up to anything. Several times the dog was fed by kind people, everything was normal. When evening came, the dog sat down a few yards away from where the first boy, Vanya Petrov, had been kidnapped. I sat down on a bench near the opposite house and lit a cigarette. It was a beautiful warm evening. There was not a single cloud in the sky, and the moon was already shining on the leaves, the houses, and the people. I was distracted for a moment as I began to look up at the starry sky, when suddenly I heard a quiet but harsh dog shriek. I immediately jumped up, dropping my cigarette, and ran in the direction where I had last seen the dog. When I came running, I heard another shriek behind the house and immediately rushed over there but more slowly and quietly, as if nothing was happening. I saw the dog, alive and well, and I saw my grandmother. It was a sweet, little, skinny grandmother who had tied the dog by the neck and was leading it somewhere with her. I followed her. I didn't know if she was a criminal or not, but I had to follow the dog. During the whole day together I became attached to her, I felt sorry for her. Grandmother led the dog quietly through the bushes and trees, and I followed just as quietly. She didn't notice me. We had been walking this way for a few minutes when suddenly grandma stopped at the entrance to an old wooden house that must have been built before the revolution. They went inside and closed the door behind them. I froze in the shadows, not daring to step out into the light. For a second I thought I was crazy, but this grandmother just took pity on a stray dog and decided to shelter it. Suddenly I heard a long screeching sound. It was a dog screaming. I jumped out of my seat and ran to the house. The door was locked, but the house was so old that I, though not without effort, broke down the door and burst inside. The dog was tied to a table by his front and back paws, and there was a bag on his head. And this sweet old lady was standing over her with a knife. She had already made an incision on his paw, which made the dog whimper loudly. I drew my gun and pointed it at the grandmother, and I yelled for her to put the knife away and move away from the dog. Grandma laughed and started approaching me with the knife in her hands. 
I yelled several times that I would shoot if she didn't stop immediately. But she didn't stop. Grandma came very close and swung the knife at me. I shot her. I hit her in the leg, and she fell to the floor. I immediately took the knife away from her, handcuffed her and bandaged her leg so she wouldn't bleed out. Once I was done with her, I bandaged the dog's paw, took the bag off him and released it. The dog huddled on the floor next to my feet and whimpered. Thirty minutes later all the police from our town and neighboring towns were in the house. When my grandmother was arrested, she laughed. Laughing like she was possessed. It was creepy. I took the dog with me. I felt sorry for him. I fed him meat at home and we fell asleep on the couch. The next day I learned the news. During a search of grandmother's house, they found clothes and objects sewn from animal and human skin. She had coats of cats and dogs and people. She even had a notebook lined with human skin. It turned out that this woman used to sew things in a factory and this hobby remained with her until her old age. But after the Soviet Union collapsed, she had nothing to eat and certainly no money for the hobby. Fur and leather are very expensive materials. So she decided to find them on the street. Dogs and cats she kidnapped with ease. She simply gave them food and took them to her house. With people it was more difficult. She would walk up to children and ask them to help her carry heavy bags, and in return she promised to give them tasty candy and cakes. Most of the children refused, they were lucky. But kids like Vanya Petrov, kind, responsible children, were not lucky. No one ever pays attention to old men who talk to children on the street. No one pays attention to old men who feed stray animals. And that's a big mistake. Our city has paid the price for such irresponsibility. Since then, the disappearances of animals and people have stopped and everyone has started living peacefully again. That grandmother was put in jail for many years and no one was afraid she would come back and start killing again. And the dog has lived with me ever since. If it hadn't been for him, I wouldn't have solved my first case. My name is Boris Dietlov and I want to tell you another story from my police career. In 1993, my police station received a call from the district officer, like a sheriff, in charge of several villages in our area. He asked us to send some police officers as assistants. I had already been working for two years then and was far from being the most helpful member of my department, so they sent me and Nikolai Kovalenko, name changed, my temporary partner who had only joined us for a month. We were not given a company car, so I took my grandfather's Volga. Together with Nikolai we set off. The journey took us more than two hours, but it was enjoyable. We listened to the band Kino and shared stories from life. Nikolai turned out to be a nice guy. He told me about his family and how he was in an orphanage when he was 15. Kovalenko had many nasty stories about the orphanage, but I'll leave them until my next story. That's not what we're talking about now. After passing another stinking pig farm, we finally reached an intersection where a police officer was sitting on the bonnet of a rusty ziggily, smoking a pipe. He had an amusing mustache, similar to Budiani, and his police uniform reinforced the resemblance. He told us that yesterday at the house of a lonely old lady, the owner of four beautiful Newfoundland dogs, was on fire. The old lady and one of her dogs died, but the fire did not affect the bodies much. According to the neighborhood officer, the naked eye can see signs of a violent death. I wanted to ask about whether there were violent alcoholics in the village or whether the dog itself could have attacked the owner, but the police officer beat me to it and said that those options were definitely ruled out. There are only a few people left in the village, most of them elderly and only one Ipatov family with young children, but they are well off and have a good reputation with their neighbors. The dogs are completely non-aggressive, and one of the dogs has exactly the same wounds as the old woman. The wounds look like blows with an axe, but he could not say for sure. The policeman said that he didn't look around the house much, he was waiting for us. So my partner and I immediately decided to move to the village to search the house. We got there quickly, and there was a small crowd of neighbors waiting for us at the entrance to the yard. Three children were running along the road and playing with three surviving dogs, one of which was a cute little puppy. The children's parents and a few old people were standing at the entrance whispering about something, but abruptly fell silent as we approached. Nikolai looked at me meaningfully, but I didn't let on that I had noticed the abrupt silence of the people. From questioning witnesses, we understand that in the middle of the night the whole little village woke up to the strong smell of burning and rushed to the aid of their neighbor. They saw some kind of shadow lurking behind the fence, but there was no one to run after the unknown person. They had to extinguish the house and rescue the old woman. The three dogs living in the street were taken out of the yard and tied to a pole by the roadside because they were in the way and could burn themselves. The fire was extinguished in a couple of hours. When the Ipatovs entered the house they saw the corpses of the dog and the landlady. The dog was holding the old woman's leg and seemed to be trying to pull her out of the house before she died. In vain. The policeman was right, they had clearly been hacked to death with an axe. The old woman died quickly, just a few blows to the head. But the dog, who was protecting the owner, was clearly beaten in a hurry, running away from the house. The wounds on her body were chaotic and not as severe, 
If the neighbors hadn't put out the fire in time, it's unlikely we would have been able to notice it all. Overall, the house was almost untouched, the arsonist had only left a couple of hearths at the entrance, which had not spread beyond the veranda and facade. Kovalenko also noticed this and rightly stressed that it was the first time the unknown person had acted in this way, but he clearly knew how to use an axe. Kovalenko and I decided to split up to question all the neighbors one by one. We spent the whole day doing this and got no useful information. A simple, lonely old lady with a bunch of dogs, chickens, and geese. Her pension was barely enough to live on. She had nothing to eat. She was always kind and treated everyone to fruit from the garden. Her son had lived in the capital for many years and did not visit her but sometimes they would call on the only phone in the village at the post office. No one wrote letters to her, there were no other relatives. We might have thought it was a fugitive intruder, but there was one fact. Someone other than this old lady had clearly been living in the house for some time. In one of the distant rooms there were men's clothes in an unsuitable size for her. The clothes had clearly been used repeatedly and recently. We called the pensioner's son from the city and he promised to come in a couple of days. We also contacted his employer. On the day of the crime he was at work and would not have had time to reach this village in such a short time, well, the murderer is not the son. Kovalenko was finishing questioning the old woman's last neighbor, and I went outside for a smoke. It was a beautiful summer night, cool and gloomily quiet. Various forests surrounded the village on three sides, but not even the sound of trees could be heard. All the animals and birds were silent too. Only the voices of grasshoppers and dragonflies could be heard in the distance. The wooden roof of a dilapidated house was visible through the tops of one of the trees in the forest. It was probably a hunting lodge. Such houses were not uncommon in these parts. Suddenly I heard a child's laughter. I shuddered, because it sounded eerie and harsh. But I quickly realized that it was just the Ipatop kids deciding to come out to play again. Just as quickly came the realization that we hadn't interviewed the neighborhood kids. The adults were clearly hiding something, but can kids keep their mouths shut? No. I headed confidently towards the house and was in their yard in the blink of an eye. There was no fence. The house was half concrete slabs and half wooden slate. It looked poor, but well maintained. The Ipatop children were playing with the dogs, who were now tied to an iron pipe sticking out next to the big garage. I stepped closer and said hello. The kids huddled together, apparently frightened. When I squatted down beside them and started asking kindly about dogs, they quickly switched to talking about animals. The children were perfectly calm, and I cautiously asked about the tragedy that had occurred. It was amusing to watch their stares and indecision. But I should not be distracted. In confidence, the children told me that a month ago a strange man had come to live with an old lady. Their parents told them that it was a babaika, a monster that scares children in Russia, and that they should not go near the old lady's house, but the children were very curious and peaked. They saw that the stranger was arguing with the old woman and drinking adult beverages very often. The children told them that he had come from the swamp forest. The man was all dirty, hairy, and smelled strongly. One girl in this group of children said he looked like the yupper, that's what the Slavs call vampires, from her book, and described him very fabulously. Pale, red-eyed, with fangs and claws. Children often do. I gave the children each a mint, which I always carried with me out of old habit, and left. The information I had received was enough for me to start questioning the adults again. I was very concerned about the fact that they were all clearly hiding something. It could have been a criminal conspiracy. But is there any reason for the inhabitants of a small village to kill some kind old woman? And the children would know the murderer they had lived here since birth. These thoughts swirled in my mind as I approached the house where my partner was. Nikolai was still sitting at the table with some old man, discussing the case. I asked him to step back and told him everything I had learned from the Ipatop children. We went back to the old man and pressed him, giving out all the facts we knew one by one. He gave in quickly, and it was so blunt. In all my thirty years of service I have never heard anything stupider. It turned out that the deceased woman's son had asked her for a favor. At his request, she was taking in a former criminal who had spent more than half his life in prison for serious crimes. A ex-co-worker of her son's, what's not to help, right? For a whole month she endured drunkenness and scandals. The man did not help the old woman at home, though he had promised to do so. He did not give her any money either, he just lived at the pensioner's expense. When he got so drunk that he started to destroy the house, the old woman decided to throw him out. That was a mistake. The neighbors did not hear anything simply because the houses in this village are a huge distance away from each other. But the fire, which the offender had set to cover his tracks, was noticed rather quickly. By the end of the story the old man was exhausted and asked to be allowed to sleep. It was well past midnight. Nikolai and I left his house and decided to spend the night in the car. Pulling back the chair, my partner asked why the hell they were hiding all this. He couldn't understand, but I understood at once. They were afraid that the killer would retaliate. It was a long night at least because I couldn't sleep. I kept seeing sounds, even though the silence was still there. 
It's a funny thing about the human brain. I thought about the cry. Where could the killer have gone? Hardly to any of the neighboring villages, since the nearest one would be dozens of kilometers away. But there are enough abandoned houses left behind by other old people, long forgotten by their children and grandchildren. But it is dangerous because of the tracks and because of the fire. I thought long and hard, and it wasn't until dawn that I remembered the hunter's lodge in the woods. Hunters in Russia like to gather in such houses and drink to their prey. There might have been alcohol there, which was what this outlaw was drinking. When I realized this, I jumped up sharply and started to wake Nikolai up. He immediately woke up and managed to quickly understand all my thoughts. I knew right away that he used to be in the army. Nice guy. We grabbed our weapons, got out of the Volga without even closing the door behind us, and raced towards the forest. As we approached the hunter's lodge, we switched off all the lights and tried to be very quiet. The criminal had killed the old woman with an axe, her own axe, which meant he had no weapon. But anything could have been lurking in the hunter's lodge, so it was worth being vigilant. Kovalenko put his hand on the door and prepared to open it. I stood directly in front of the entrance and prepared to shoot. The moment Nikolai sharply opened the door, a hunting knife whistled past my head. Time slowed down, it was a strange feeling. I had experienced the same feeling more than once afterwards during the service. I managed to make out the blade of the knife, rusty enough that any self-respecting hunter would have stopped using it twenty years ago. It appeared to be a desperate attempt by the killer. Maybe he was still drunk, though. The neighbors were not afraid to talk about this madman for nothing. While I was pondering all sorts of nonsense, Kovalenko was already firing in the direction the knife came from, but to no avail. We had spooked the killer, and chasing him at night in such vast forests would be the stupidest idea in the world. More stupid than going looking for him in a hunting lodge in the middle of the night, wouldn't it? We returned to the car and spent the rest of the morning discussing our low intelligence. Fortunately, by midday a group of policemen had arrived. They were busy catching the culprit and we were praised, scolded, and sent home. This story seemed to have a good ending. The villain was caught a couple of days later in the forest. The old woman was buried where she wanted it. The dogs stayed with the Ipatov family for years to come. Except that the old woman's house was abandoned. The son never came to the grave after the funeral. The murderer was released from prison after 15 years, and set off again on his endless wanderings. No one lives in that village among the three forests anymore. The old people are dead. The Ipatov family moved away. All the houses have collapsed and rotted away.